Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Quiet today. We're reading from Psalm 92 this morning. It says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, Most High, to proclaim your loyal love in the morning, your faithfulness in the night, with a ten string harp and the melody of the lyre, because you have made me happy, O Lord, by your acts. I sing with joy because of your handiwork. How awesome are your works, Lord! Your thoughts are so deep. The ignorant people do not know, and fools do not understand. And though the wicked spring up like grass, and all evildoers seem to blossom, they do so only to be destroyed forever. But you, O Lord, are exalted forever. Let's pray. God, we come into this place today to do just that, to exalt your name, to lift your name higher above any other name for you alone are worthy in this place. God, as we come to meet with you, may your presence fill this place. May you speak to us. May you change us. God, may our worship and our exaltation rise as sweet unto you, God. We exalt you, we worship, and we praise you in this place where there is none like you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand and worship with us this morning?
on the street and said, what are they talking about? Running out of a grave. <laughs> but how you know we were a grave is to sin, right? And we set us free. I don't know about you, but that's worth repeating and worth rejoicing about. Amen. God is good. And he is just. And he never leaves us or forsakes us. Lord, we thank you, Lord. We still remember what you did for us on that cross, Lord. Thank you for saving us from our sins, Lord. Thank you for those baptisms last week, Lord, where once they were lost, but now they are found. But we thank you for what you've done. Hallelujah. He is a good, good Father, isn't he? He's good to us.
miracles. Is this what happened after resurrection? And as the women went and told the disciples, they were still filled, for they had not seen our Savior risen. And when Jesus came and revealed himself to them, the first thing he said to them was, peace be on you. Peace to you. I don't know where you are today or what's going on in your life, but that same promise, that same words Jesus spoke to them, he can speak to us today. Wherever you are, may peace just raise on you. May just fall on you in Jesus' name. May the blessing of the Lord just fall on you. Sometimes the song is a closing, but I just felt led to sing it today. The blessing of the Lord. May his words be upon you.
Faithful God, faithful God. Lord, we pray that for us here today, God. We pray for our children, God. And should you tarry, God, we pray for future generations, Lord, the favor of the Lord, the kingdom of God. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, God. That's our, our prayer today. That's our prayer for this next hour together, Lord. That's our prayer for this week. Until you come again, oh, Lord, let your kingdom come. God, we, we pray as a follow-up in this Easter season, Lord, we prayed all month that the the darkness will be pushed back. That, Lord, the name of Jesus will be lifted up. And so, Lord, we pray for seeds that were watered and, and uh, sown and that the, the word of the Lord that was lifted up last week. God, continue the work you've begun. God, I pray, Holy Spirit, just bring remembrance the good news that was preached around the world, Lord, and continue to change lives and set the captives free. We pray in Jesus' name. The Lord, the song we sang would be their song. Lord, until you come again. Faithful God, good Father, we bless your name today. God, meet us here today. Our hearts are on your altar. As we often pray, God, whatever you need to do, have your way in our lives today. May you be lifted up. In Jesus' wonderful name, we pray. Amen. 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 Be seated this morning. Praise the Lord. church. What a great Easter resurrection morning we had last Sunday and water baptismals and celebration and the, the hope of Jesus and the empty tomb and uh, the resurrection brings hope. And the uh, good news is we're not done. It's going to be a great spring and summer around here in Bethel. In fact, on the back table, there's bulletins there. There's a tear out there. It has a bunch of dates on the right-hand side. There's camps and retreats and senior saint retreat and uh, all sorts of dates that are in there. So be sure and grab one of those. Uh, we're doing some special events this summer. We're trying to do a big outdoor event every month, uh, all summer long. Bethel Summer Tour 2021. <laughs> First service, we tell you, you guys just laugh. And, uh, but, uh, so we're looking forward to just doing some outdoor water baptismals, worship night out at the barn, some evenings in the park. Uh, summer and kids camp are, are a go. And so those dates are in the bulletin also. In fact, I think registration's already up for kids camp. So make sure you get your kids registered. President Biden sent you money. Uh, to send your kids to camp. I don't know if you got that check in the mail yet. So, uh, speaking of your children and your children, I don't be paying that bill. But uh, so, uh, see how I tied those two things together there. And uh, so, camps. The dates are in there. Registration's already up online for kids camp. We're going to need a few extra workers and counselors this year uh, for them to be able to pull camp off this year. They had to lessen the number of kids in a cabin, and so we need a few more workers. And so, if you would pray about that, see. Uh, Pastor Ethan or, or Sonia, and what do I need to do, or how would it, what happens, how does that work? It's a great week. All your food is provided. It's wonderful campgrounds, air conditioned, and uh, but we're going to need a few extra workers uh, this year. So just a little heads up in advance. So uh, take out your Bibles, turn to Matthew 28, if you would. Matthew 28. Matthew 28 is the resurrection story. That's where we were last week. Uh, Jesus is resurrected, and uh, the hope of Easter. And so go ahead and turn to Matthew 28, if you would, this morning. Beginning of that chapter, it's dawn. The two Marys head off to the tomb, see what's going on. The stone's been rolled away. There was an earthquake. And uh, the soldiers were afraid. They became like dead men. Uh, of course, that famous section that was read all over the world last Sunday, verse 5 there. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he is risen from the dead and is going ahead to you into Galilee. And you will see him there. Now I have told you. Of course, that great story from last week, right? Uh, the ladies run off. And uh, I love the, the little, this isn't the sermon, but a little bonus here today. The quote from Matthew 28, 8. Afraid yet filled with joy. They're afraid yet filled with joy. And you don't have to raise your hand, but how many have been there before, right? You're excited. God's doing something. But you're kind of afraid a little bit, right? You're not quite sure what he's doing. This is supernatural. This is out of your territory. Uh, afraid yet filled with joy. I just want to, that's a little bonus there. Uh, this, this isn't ungodly fear. This isn't the lies of the enemy that we're going to talk about here just a little bit. But sometimes you're just going into territory. You're not quite sure what's going on. But you know God's moving. And so you're excited about it. So that's okay. A little uh, afraid but filled with joy. Uh, but that brings us to, so that's our setting for us today. So Jesus is resurrected. 
Uh, the ladies have gone into town. The soldiers have fallen like dead men. So we're going to pick up that story here in verse number 11. Let's jump on in verse number 11. And so while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. And when the chief priests had met the elders and devised the plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You were to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. And so the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews till this very day. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word today. And Lord, I pray that your word would come alive to us today. I pray that we would see you who you are, and we would see our enemy for who he is. And God, we want to be people of truth. We want to walk in your spirit. We want to be people of your word, people of truth. And so, Lord, have your way in our lives today, we pray. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. So that's our setting. We're going to kind of the setting, the backdrop of last Sunday, the resurrection. Tomb is empty. Angels, the ladies, the story, the good report. But then as we kind of move into today's sermon, part two of that is now the soldiers are worried. Are we going to lose our life? Not just am I going to lose my job, are they going to kill me? Uh, we failed. The, the tomb uh, was sealed. Uh, the stone was there, and now he's gone. And so what's going to happen after that? And all of a sudden, we got turmoil right out of the gate. You know, have you ever had like, a, like, like the best day of your life? You got a hundred on your test. You got a raise at work. and Everything, you know, just everything's going perfectly. And you're just, you're kind of floating on air and, and things are, everything's going just wonderful. Somebody just paid you an incredible compliment. You feel the best that you've ever felt about yourself. And you're going down the hallway. And then here comes that person. You know, that, that person who, their spiritual gift is criticism. And, uh, you know, they just come, they can suck the life out of, out of a room. And, and it's just like a spiritual punch to the gut. And, and, you know, they can find the dark cloud or the dark lining in every cloud. They just, that's their gift. Not the, not the, the glass is half empty and it's also poisoned and we're all going to die. You know, that kind of person. <laughs> you know, there's the gloom and doom and you, you're feeling so great. Things are wonderful and, and fantastic. And that's not necessarily the sermon today. We're not talking about that person. But, but sometimes in life, you're, you're, you know, it's Resurrection Sunday. <laughs> what could get better than this? The tomb is empty and there's earthquakes and angels and and the good report, and, and then comes the enemy, who's just going to try to trip that up right out of the gate. We're just going to sow a little, some lies and some discord and, and see if we can mess this up before this thing gets any traction in here. And so, uh, so as we leave the highs and the joys, the celebrations of Resurrection Sunday last weekend, guess what? The enemy would love to trip you up this week. He'll give you your little Easter celebration. But he's waiting around the corner to discourage and lie and confuse and just kind of undermine and divide and discourage along the way. He wants to steal your joy, to kind of distract you. And, and here's a great example. It's just the resurrection has just happened. The women are still on. In fact, it says they're, the women, while the women are on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. And when the chief priests had met with the elders and devised the plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money telling them, you were to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him while we were asleep. Which brings us to the sermon title today, The Enemy's a Liar. <laughs> the Enemy's a Liar. I'm going to say that about 100 times today. And uh, just to let that soak down into our spirit. But the enemy is a liar. That may seem like a downer after last week. You know, last week was the resurrection brings hope, and then the week after is like the enemy's a liar, right? So, but really these things tie two together. Because often Satan likes to trip us up right after we've had that high moment. You've had this wonderful experience of the tomb is empty. God has done something in your life. You've just been baptized. You just got saved. You went to a revival meeting. You got back from camp. And, and whenever you have a mountain, this is my theology, whenever you have a spiritual mountaintop experience, the enemy is going to be waiting right there just to discourage you. Just to kind of sow a little discord. Just to kind of maybe kind of make you doubt a little bit. And just kind of bring a little discouragement, a little fear. It's either last week or maybe in the week before we mentioned that, that our enemy is Satan and uh, he has plans for you. Satan's got a plan for your life, right? John 10, 10. Thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's Satan's plan for your life. He wants to steal, kill, uh, and destroy. Now, that's only the first half of verse 10. In fact, we got the second half of verse 10 on our letterhead, right? Uh, I have come that you could have life and have it to the full. That's on our letterhead. I think it's probably on the bus. And I have come that you could have life and, and have it to the full. Abundant life. Jesus brings Abundant life. I don't know about you, but I like the second half of that verse a lot better than the first half. 
And so I don't, I don't want to dwell in the first half. I want to, I want to hang out more in the, in the second half of abundant life and who our God is and who Jesus is. But at the same time, I want to be wise and mature and remember the first half of the verse. That there is an end. And he has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And so, once again, this isn't a sermon of fear. It's not a sermon of worry today. We don't have to cower. It's just a reminder. Hey, you've got an enemy, and he's a liar. You've got an enemy, and he's a liar. In fact, Jesus himself calls Satan out John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, Jesus is meeting with the religious leaders, and they're kind of having this back and forth and debate, and they're going you know, back and forth. Often with Jesus, they're trying to trip him up. They're trying to make him make a mistake, and they're trying to find cracks in his, in his theology. And in fact, Jesus had started off by telling them, I am the light of the world, which really ticked them off, right? And so, and so I am the light of the world. They didn't like that at all. That gets them all jacked up. Now there's debating, going back and forth. Later on in the chapter, John 8, 32, Jesus said, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Right? Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So that makes them mad also. And so, once again, more back and forth and back and forth. And, of course, the religious leaders, they always get upset, don't they? Because they can't. Jesus is just smarter than they are. He's God, all right? So part one, under the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But their arguments and their falsehoods and their half-truths and they, they just never can beat him. And so they're, they're looking foolish, uh, you know, and all this stuff, and they're debating, and they're getting angry. And in fact, at one point in the, in the argument, here's what they said to Jesus. Aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and demon-possessed? Aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and demon-possessed? That's like two of the worst things you could call a good Jewish boy, right, at, at that time. You're a Samaritan, right? So they looked at the Samaritan dogs. And it's like a junior high recess fight, right? Because, you know, you're losing the battle. You don't have any hope. And you go, oh, yeah, well, yeah, you're a Samaritan, right? And so they're the, the worst thing. They, could, they, they can't beat him on intellect or spirituality. So they'll call him a Samaritan. doesn't mean much to you, but back then, that's bad. So they're Samaritan. Or you're demon-possessed, right? We'll go to the opposite. You're either the son of God or you're demon possessed. That's like a, that's a big gap, right? That's a big gap. And, and so, so they have no, nothing to prove. And so they, it's just, it, it was like some junior hires at a recess. Well, you're, we're right in saying you're a Samaritan and you're demon possessed. But here's, here's the truth that Jesus had spoken to them earlier that was making them so angry. 43 through 45. He says, why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you don't believe me. And so all of a sudden, right there, Jesus isn't going to lower himself to name calling, but he's going to expose truth. He's going to expose the enemy for who he is. And guess what? The enemy's a liar. He's a liar, father of lies, lies, he speaks his native language, and that's just who he is. And so right there, Jesus exposes the enemy for who he really is. He's a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. There's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Not some Pharisee name-calling game going on here, but just, guess what? Know your enemy. Know your enemy, and your enemy is a liar. Your enemy is a father of lies. When he lies, he's speaking his native language. It's, that's who he is. He's a murderer from the beginning. And so he's going to lie to you. He's going to try to frighten you. He wants to undermine your faith. He wants to make you second guess. He wants you to worry about what people think. He wants you to be self-conscious and, and, and doubt and fear and, and worry. And, and it, right, all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, this is what he's always done. Genesis 3, we talked about that a week or two ago. It, it's the Garden of Eden. There is no sin. Everything is perfect. There's the presence of God, and, and there's no sin, there's no death, there's no sorrow, there's no mourning. God meets with them in the evenings. Everything that he has, they need has been provided, and God said, hey, just don't do one thing. Just, if you would not do this one thing, not just, it wasn't a suggestion, it was all, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. How hard can that be, honestly? Everything you have is provided. And you're in the Garden of Eden. How more straightforward could God tell them uh, than that. If, and, but then here what? Here comes Satan. Everything is perfect, and here comes the deceiver. Genesis 3 1. So he, Satan, said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So, once again, it's kind of true, but just kind of 
Just sowing a little wondering. You know, just a little question there. But look at Eve here. She, she knows what God has said. Eve says. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. And so guess what? Eve knows the truth. Guess what? Satan knows the truth. But then we come up to the next verse. The next verse, the Satan begins his lies. You will surely not die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, eat of it your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. Knowing good and evil, you will surely not die. You're going to be like God. So, so Eve knows the truth. Satan knows the truth. But he's just going to begin to sow just a little, a little wonder. I wonder, what, could that be true? Maybe God wasn't honest with me. Maybe there is more out there. And, and uh, you know, all the little doubt begins to get sowed in there. You just begin to wonder a little bit. The truth gets undermined. Just a little, there's a little crack in there. And he's just, you know, just, he just wants to be your friend, right? So he's just trying to be your friend, trying to help her out. Yeah, hey, you could be like God. That sounds kind of cool, doesn't it? And it's not that bad, you know. God just, God's not that much fun, right? And so, and so God's holding back on you. And, and uh, you know, the world's having so much more fun than you are. Of course, there's only two of them. But, you know, the world's having so much more fun than you are. You're missing out. It's not a big deal. Nobody will notice. Just ask for forgiveness later. Don't you want to fit in? Just come on. Just, just try it. Just try it. You will surely not die. Emmy's a liar. <laughs> From Genesis chapter 3, you can follow all the way through the Old Testament, all through the Gospels, Jesus' crucifixion. We'll make up a story. We'll come up with a scheme. We'll try to hide our tracks all throughout the New Testament. And still up, it remains up to today. The enemy is a liar. Now you'd be saying, okay, Pastor, we get it. You've said it like 30 times now. The enemy is a liar. And so we get it. But it's more than just gaining facts today, more than just a mental ascent. Because the, the fact is that our enemy has been tripping up people since Genesis chapter 3. Right before that. Well, that's a whole other story. And, uh, but, but, you know, since Adam and Eve, because you have an enemy who hates you. You have an enemy who's come to steal and kill and destroy. Creation in the Garden of Eden. Hey, you won't die. Go ahead. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be okay. Here we are on Resurrection Day. He's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he laid. All right, you're to say this. You know, the disciples came during the night, and they stole him away while we were asleep. All right? Big Resurrection Day. Lies. Confusion. Well, I wonder. Maybe. I'm not sure. Begins to sow that. Revelation chapter 12 says, There was a loud voice from heaven declaring, uh, Satan to be the accuser of the brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night. The accuser of the brethren who accuses them before our God day and night. Just the accuser. Just this and kind of a shot here and a shot there. In fact, we see a little a glimpse of that in Job, right? Job chapter 1. Think of the story of, of Job. Uh, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came with them also. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord. From roaming throughout the earth, back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one else on the earth like him. Blameless, upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And then comes the accuser, right? Why does he fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything that he has? You bless the work of his hands and his flocks and his herds and spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. He's not as good as you say he is. Later in chapter 2, skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life, but stretch out your hands and strike his flesh and bones and he will surely curse you to his face. Just accuse, lie, confuse, divide, just tear down. The enemy's a liar. Think about it. He even came after Jesus, right? Remember, Jesus is getting ready to go into his his years of ministry, he's about 30 years old, and he goes out into the wilderness for 40 days, fast and pray for, for 40 days, and he's getting ready to start his, his ministry, and there's going to be miracles. He's going to raise the dead and walk on the water and multiply the food and heal the sick and cast out the, the demons. And so he's getting ready, right, to enter into that phase of ministry, but he's taking this time in the wilderness. And in fact, Matthew 4 says, uh, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
So then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him. It's also written, don't put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him and his angels came and attended him. So here Jesus is getting ready for the, the very foundation, the big beginning of his, quote, of his ministry. And here comes the tempter. Hey, why don't you go a different way? Bow down to me. I'll give you everything you want. It just begins to sow lies and discord. And in fact, the devil even quotes scripture. That's kind of confusing. The devil's quoting scripture to him. Isn't it written in the Bible? that you know, He goes back to the scripture and begins to, to quote it to him. Isn't it written? Uh, what do you say here? Uh, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. That's scripture. Satan quotes it to him. The Apostle Paul, he was writing to the Corinthians, the second letter. He, he likened Satan. He said, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. In fact, here's what I read in chapter 11, 2 Corinthians. Talking about these false teachers, false apostles who are going around. He said, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserves. Satan himself masquerades as angels of light. His servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Not everybody who quotes scripture is of God and godly. Not everybody who quotes scripture is of God or is, is godly. Just because someone can out-argue you doesn't make them right. Just because somebody's loud doesn't mean they're anointed, right? <laughs> And uh, the volume doesn't always equal uh, the anointing of God, right? Because the enemy's a liar. The enemy, he's quoting scripture to Jesus. You know, and in fact, we're looking at some of these other stories. There's going to be some, be some truth woven in there, but it gets turned around. He even agrees with Eve a little bit. But what about this over here? And it's so important that we realize this because these are some of the great tactics that the enemy uses against us. He, he lies to us. He's the accuser of the brothers and sisters. Kind of half-truths, a little rumor, a little, a little deception. In fact, as I was putting the sermon together, one of the first stories that just kind of kept pop, popping back to mind was Elijah. Elijah is this great prophet of the Old Testament, right? First Kings. And in fact, one of the, the great stories of Elijah, Ahab has become the king of Israel. Ahab is just bad. His wife is Jezebel, who's worse. And so uh, Israel is in a terrible place. Wicked, immorality. Idol worship is rampant. Things are not good in Israel during the time of King Ahab and Jezebel. And so God sends the prophet Elijah to bring a word to them. So God says, Elijah, go tell the king that it's not going to rain for the next few years until he says. And so he goes to the king and says, it's not going to rain for the next few years, and he leaves. And guess what happens? It doesn't rain because God's a God of truth. And so it doesn't rain for several years. And so there's some cool stories in the middle. We don't have time for all of that. Um, but, but eventually, God said, okay, Elijah, it's time to go back and talk uh, to the king today. So he goes back to the king. The king sees him coming. The king says, is that you, you troubler of Israel, right? I guess, I guess Elijah's fault. Uh, and so, but here's what Elijah said. I've not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. But you and your father's family have. You've abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. And bring the 450 prophets of Baal. The 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table, so they were feeding him, they were doing all that. And so Ahab sent word throughout all the, uh, of Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. And so we don't have time, to, this is like chapters long, so we don't have time for all of this, but they gather all the people. They get all the prophets of Baal, all the prophets of Asherah, they're going to the mountain, and they're going to have like this spiritual showdown, right? This uh, the big battle of the ages. And, and uh, so kind of the what happens is he said, okay, you guys build your altar, and I'm going to build my altar, and then you, you know, put your sacrifice on yours, I'll put my sacrifice on mine, and we're all going to call out to God, and, and whoever's God answers by fire, that's the true God. And so they're going to have a little showdown. In fact, here's what, exactly what he said. He said, then you call on the name of your God, I'll call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire, he is God. And then all the people said, what you say 
is good. All right, so long story, long story, long story. And so they, they build all that. And so all day long, they're calling out to God and they're screaming, they're cutting themselves, they're bleeding, they're dancing, they're, they're yelling, making as much noise as they can so that their false gods can hear them. Guess what happened? Their false gods don't hear them because their gods are false. Excellent, thanks for playing along today. Because uh, their gods are false. And so, but listen here in verse 38 Elijah rebuilds the altar. Puts a sacrifice on it. In fact, he dumps water all over it. For go, we're going big today, right? So just soaks it in water. The trenches around it are filled with water. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burnt. So he calls out to the name of the Lord. Very simple prayer. And then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice. The wood, the stones, the soil. Licked up the water that was in the trench. When the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the valley and slaughtered there. And Elijah said to Ahab, go and eat, for there's a sound of heavy rain. <laughs> there's a sound of heavy rain. What's that got to do with our sermon this morning? What's that got to do with us today? Because as you look ahead, just a couple days later, because that's like every pastor's dream right there, Right? The fire falls from heaven, and, they do, and the enemies are destroyed, and, and uh, everybody begins to chant, the Lord, he is God. You're like, do that for me one Sunday, okay? And, uh, and so uh, that's like every, uh, it doesn't get any better than this. Uh, if you're a prophet, Old Testament prophet, that's pretty cool, right? That's pretty cool. That's a good day at the office. And, uh, and so, but then we're going to, if you keep following, what's that got to do with today? You follow that story a couple days later, and we can kind of trace the story of Elijah. Because Queen Jezebel has sent a messenger to Elijah says, by the end of sundown today, I'm going to kill you. And guess what? She's killed a lot of prophets. So this, she's not just like faking it. She means it. If this is going to be one more prophet she's going to kill. And so we got Elijah. He's afraid. He's on the run. He's depressed. Chapter 19, it said he came to a broom bush and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the, the brush and he fell asleep. Just take my life. Just ready to give up. Press. In fact, twice later on he would tell God this. He said, I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. He says that twice. I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. It's one of the big lies we talk about the enemy. I've mentioned this like eight times a year. One of the lies of the enemy is you're the only one. You're the only one. God loves everybody else better than you, but there's, then there's you. You're the, he doesn't really like you that much. He keeps you around, but, you know, you're the only one. Nobody else has gone through what you've gone through. Nobody else would understand. You've got it harder than everybody else. God likes everybody else better. And everybody, I don't know if you ever notice this, but everybody else gets the easy life, and you've got the hard life. You know, you're the only one. It's just one of, it's one of the lies of the enemy. Your enemy is, is a liar. And here sits the prophet Elijah after this huge, miraculous fire from heaven victory amazing day and it's a couple days later and he's sitting under a bush going wish i was dead i'm the only one left nobody cares you know just kind of it's like a country song you know just all this you know. the enemy's a liar now in the natural there's some true things going on queen Je jezebel really did send a, a messenger to just say i'm going to kill you guess what she meant it. she's killed other prophets so this is this would be normal for her, uh, you know, Israel is hugely in a mess. They are hugely backslidden. And so Israel is, is a mess. Uh, but God is the God of truth. And guess what? God gets the final word. And guess what? Elijah's not going to die. Jezebel is. That's like Second Kings. Go look that up. You can read that uh, this week. She's going to die like a weird, ugly death. In fact, then God said, You're not, guess what? You're not the only one. There's 7,000 have not bowed and kissed the Baal. You're not the only one. But in his mind, he's the only one. In his mind, he's a failure. In his mind, God has just kind of left him. And, but guess what? You're not the only one. Jezebel, she's going to be the one. Because what? The enemy is a liar. And we could go on and on with stories out of Scripture. We could probably have testimony service today when you've gotten tripped up by a lie of the enemy. And, and, and you've been deceived, and you got, and you got discouraged, and, and, uh, and we could share our own stories here. But guess, this isn't a sermon of fear. This isn't a sermon of fear. It's not a woe is me sermon. Oh, poor us, you know, 
Let's go sit under the broom tree with Elijah. This is just a good reminder as we come out of the triumph of Easter season, even on our highest days, even when everything that seems to be going perfect, when it's in the Garden of Eden on resurrection morning, when there's fire falling from heaven and consuming a sacrifice, you've been with God for 40 days in, in the wilderness and you're getting ready to go out and do miracles. It's just a reminder that you have an adversary. And he's a liar. He's a deceiver. He's not your friend. He's your enemy. He's accused us of brothers and sisters. In fact, he's such a liar that lying is his native language. He's the father of lies. How would you like that? He's the father of lies. And he's going to accuse you. He's going to remind you of your past and what you did in that one time. And remember when. He's going to try to cause you to stumble. He's going to tell you how you're the only one. They're trying to get you to walk in fear. You can't do that. You're not smart enough. You're not good looking enough. You don't have enough stuff. You don't have enough education. You don't have enough money. And, and God's kind of forgotten you anyway. And he really didn't even like you that much to start with. You're too old. You're too young. And, and Jesus isn't resurrected. That's just a story they made up. And, and uh, you know, try to fit in. Take the shortcut. Holiness is kind of out of style anyway. People are going to laugh at you. Just try to fit in. Don't be too Christian. The Bible can't all, if there was really an ark, the Bible can't all be true. And just kind of do whatever you want. God just wants you to be happy anyway. But in those times, just remember this. The enemy's a liar. <laughs> He's a liar. And sometimes they'll take a little truth. Jezebel really did want to kill him. Jezebel really was in a bad place. But he'll distort that. And he'll twist it. He'll take some of what God said. He'll quote some scripture. But then twist it a little bit. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. Here, here's five little simple ways. This isn't an exhaustive list. But how can we combat that enemy? Number one, know the truth. How do you, how do you combat a lie? You just know the truth. We've got to be people of the truth. We have to be people uh, of the word. In fact, a few verses there before Jesus called Satan the father of lies. What did he say there in 832? He said, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When you know the truth, truth brings freedom. The truth for Elijah was, you're not going to die. The truth for Elijah was, you're not the only one. And so you can read, the, we're not trying to read all that story, but out of that uh, leads us all the way to Elisha. And so you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The best way to fight lies is to know the truth. What's the truth? It's the word. The word is true. And so that's why we, we, we talk about often, you've got to be in the Word every week. Every, if you're just kind of limping along from Sunday to Sunday and just kind of getting through, man, you've got you to know the truth. <clears throat> in the last days, there's going to be a lot of deception. How do I know? You know the truth. You know, if, if you're just kind of in the Word every now and then, you know, and there's this little tickling in your doctrine, and somebody said this over here, and that sounds good, I don't know, but we've got to go back to the truth. This will be right every time. This is right. Every time. So we have to be people of truth. The enemy is a liar, but the word of God is true. Be in the word of God. Know the truth, number one. Number two, hang out with solid Christian people. Hang out with solid Christian people. Now, we live in the world. You've got to go to work. You've got relatives. And uh, you know, so Jesus hung out with sinners, right? Jesus ate with tax collectors and prostitutes. And, and, uh, but take your strength from people of truth. So you need people in your life who are going to sharpen you. So sometimes they're going to hold you accountable, uh, but they're going to love you. You're going to grow together, and they're going to be the one you need to draw strength from. Not Hollywood, not the media, not your unsaved friends. We're going to draw strength from the people <clears throat> who are also people of truth. So you need good, solid people of truth in your life. So be, know the truth. Hang out with solid Christian people. Number three, be discerning and listen to the Spirit. Be discerning and listen to the spirit. Once again, Jezebel was wicked. She had killed other prophets. She wanted to kill Elijah. She sent a messenger, I'm going to kill you. Israel was backsliding, a backslidden. But God gets the final say. And when he finally settles down under that tree, and the angel, and, and, and the voice of the Lord, and all of that, and when he finally comes to truth, now he's restored. Now he's ready to go again. So learn to be sensitive to the spirit's voice. Pray, seek the Lord. He is truth. And so we need to be people of prayer. Not just talking, but listening. Prayer is a two-way street. And so we want to be sensitive to the voice of the Lord. What's God saying? Guess what? God knows more than you do. He sees the future. 
He knows what's in Jezebel's heart. He knows what she's done before. It doesn't matter to God because he's God. And so we're in his hands. And so she's the one that's going to die the unnatural death. He's the one that's going to live on. And so we see the story there. And so we need to walk in the spirit. We need to be people listening and discerning the voice of the spirit. Pray, seek the Lord. He is truth. Number four, go to church. You're here, right? Good job. Congratulate yourself. Shake the hand of the person next to you. All right, go, go to church. This isn't some cheap commercial today from the pastor. But I've said this a hundred times also. Isolation is a tactic of the enemy. Isolation is a tactic of the enemy. Isolate, lie, discourage, beat down, repeat. Isolate, lie, discourage, beat down, repeat. You need to be in fellowship. In corporate. You need to be in corporate worship. You need Emily and Kim just to belt it out one Sunday morning and the hair stands up on the back of your neck and everybody's around just singing and the presence of the Lord is here. And, and uh, this place isn't sacred, but as we gather as the people of God, the spirit of the Lord is here. You need times like that. We need to gather together to worship the Lord together, to, to pray for one another. That, uh, you know, we talk about hanging out the altars, hang out with Jesus for a while. You need altar times. You need times where we're together and you're being uh, encouraged. So it's the beginning. Uh, maybe you had a bad last week, but it's Sunday. You don't know what the week holds, but this is Sunday. So what a way to start off your week in the house of the Lord with the people of God in corporate worship and, and encouragement of the word and people who love you, people who pray for you, the ministry of truth, water baptisms, potlucks, uh, whatever it is. Um, so go to church often. Go to church often. All right? You need that. You need that in your life. And then last one, number five. Stay close to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus. There's a lot of voices in the world. Some people are going, oh, wait, no, they stole the body of Jesus. It was them that came in the middle of the night and they took him away. Hey, why don't you throw yourself down and show us who you are and show off and do a miracle for us. And, hey, bow down to me. I'll give you the world. You can have it. I'm going to kill you. You're the only one. You'd be better off dead. All the voices of the world. Stay close to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus. There's Elijah out under a tree all by himself and just sitting. I'm the only one. I'm the only one. You know, Jesus has been off in the wilderness. Of course, he is Jesus, but you know, he's with the Holy Spirit. But here come the lies of the enemy. And we, we see it time and time again. Stay close. Stay close to Jesus. Because what? guess what? Your enemy's a liar. He's a liar. So once again, this is an exhaustive list, but just five simple things. Number one, know the truth. Know the truth. The truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. Number one. Number two, hang out with solid Christian people. People who are going to love you, who are going to pour into your life. They're going to pick you up when you're down. They're going to call you out when you're, when you're straying. Hang out with solid Christian people. Be discerning and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Be discerning and listen to the voice. Lots of voices out there. Some of them are kind of true. Some are half truth. Some are truth turned upside down. Hey, doesn't the Bible say this? And, so knowing that and understanding that, go to church, go to church, and stay close to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus. Musicians, come if you guys would. And ladies, we're going to lead us in some worship here today. A couple things as we close today. Of course, number one is always this. If you need Jesus, today's the day. If you need a Savior, it all starts there. God loves you. That's why we celebrated Easter. The empty tomb, the resurrection. He took our sin upon himself. He became sin for us so that we could be forgiven. If you need Jesus, call out to him today. If you want me, I'd love to pray with somebody. If that's you here today, you're like, I need, I need to repent. I need to call out to the Lord today. We'd love to do that today. Why don't you go ahead and stand, guys, if you wouldn't. And then, but then number two, if you're alive and breathing and you're here today, which you all are, guess what? You've been lied to. You've been lied to. Satan's lied to you. This and that and deception, things of this world. That's just where we live. That's just a, that's a story of, of life. But maybe some of those things have stuck a little bit. Maybe you've, been, maybe you've been injured. Maybe you've been hurt. And maybe the lies of the enemy just weighed down heavy upon you. And today you just need some relief. Maybe you just want to come and sit and hang out with Jesus. Maybe you want somebody to pray with you. Just say, hey, pray with me today. You just need to walk back in the truth. Be reminded of who you are as a son and, and daughter of God. Because we live here, right? And this world just gets heavy at times. I mean, if Elijah can call down fire from heaven and a couple days later we go, I wish I was dead, I guess what? You're vulnerable too. And so am I. 
And so we just need to be aware of it. That's true. And so maybe God just, some of you just need a refreshing. Day. You need to be reminded who you are in Jesus. You just need to be reminded that hey, the devil's a liar. It's just not true. So they're going to lead us in worship. These altars are open. We'd love to have you come. I want someone to pray with you. I'll be here. But let's just draw close to him today. Let's be close to Jesus today. Let's listen to his voice. Lead us, ladies. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Wonderful sin. Wonderful sin. Times in your life you've stumbled, you've been discouraged. And so we're all in this together. So let's just pray for one another together. Lord, we come in Jesus' name. We thank you that you're the God of truth. You're the God of freedom. 
You're the God of life, the God that brings life. You're the one who cuts through the lies of the enemy. And so, Lord, we just pray for our brothers and sisters here today. In Jesus' name, God, we pray they would walk in freedom. God, they would walk in truth and walk in your spirit. That God, they would, they would spot the lies of the enemy. They would, they would see through the kind of the half-truths, so a little bit of truth, but maybe not so. And that God, they would put their hope and their trust in the God of the future, the God who holds us in your hands. And so that God, that we could walk in truth and that would set us free. So God, we want to walk in freedom. So we pray for one another. I pray for those who, who maybe have been beaten down, maybe in their childhood or maybe something at work or something. Somebody in our family, God, who just kind of sown discord and anger and just rudeness and the lies of the enemy. and just, Or sometimes it just wears on us. But I just pray that you would lift that today. God, we pray for this for freedom today. If there needs to be healing, physical, spiritual, emotional, God, bring healing today. God, restore. Put salve on the wounds of this broken world that we live in. And God, restore them. And Lord, help us as a church to come together, to walk together, to lift us up in our time of need, to rejoice together and to mourn together. And so, God, I pray for that, for freedom and healing today, restoration. Sons and daughters of God, the sons and daughters of God, we pray. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Walk in truth this week. Praise his name. Amen.